I'm William O'Flaherty. Welcome to the All About Jack podcast on the Knowing and Understanding C.S. Lewis YouTube channel. This is a special crossover episode with the Inklings Variety Hour, a podcast from Chris Pipkin. When the two of us originally recorded together, the thought was for us to release both shows on the debut of the first annual C.S. Lewis Reading Day. However, I'm releasing this episode early. The reading day is actually November 29th. So you will hear a comment from time to time as if our shows were both released on the 29th. In a moment, I'll talk with Chris about some of the most enjoyed books or essays by Lewis from him. But before diving in, let me briefly explain the purpose of C.S. Lewis Reading Day. First, November 29th is Lewis's birthday, and it's obviously common to celebrate a person's life on their birthday. So this reading day is one small way to celebrate the life and writing of C.S. Lewis in hopes of encouraging people to read or reread his works. In addition to a variety of groups doing something special on the reading day, there will be a live show at 7 p.m. Eastern and Pacific on November 29th, hosted by Pints with Jack. They are the creators of the C.S. Lewis Reading Day. Well, with all that out of the way, welcome Chris to the show for the first time. Glad to finally have you on All About Jack. Oh, it's great to be here, William. Um, so good to see you. It's been a long time. Uh, we we last, I believe, dined together in Oxford, um, as yes. as two fans of C.S. Lewis are want to do from time to time. Um, but uh, yeah, and and I've had you on my own show uh, to talk about what C.S. Lewis did and didn't say, um, which mm. was which was fantastic. Um, but, uh, yeah, good, good to be here. Excited to celebrate C.S. Lewis reading day with you. So, but, but before we talk about some favorite books or essays by Lewis, and I think Chris here, just like me, did some changes in the last minute. They're going to be all books, but we were kind of thinking through, like we could pick a, you know, a few books, a few essays, and we're just kind of see how it kind of settles here. But I think it's going to be just books. Uh, let's see the, the, uh, the screw tape letters, uh, you uh, want to uh, share some thoughts about. Uh, I, I think I've, I've shared a few things on my website and podcast about it, but we're going to let you have some reflections first of all. And so tell us about your encounter with the screw tape letters and why it's a favorite of yours. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I was thinking about not just favorite Lewis books, but also Lewis books that I could sort of pin to a particular moment in my life, um, partly because, you know, this is C.S. Lewis rating day. So we're talking about uh, we're, we're, we're trying to encourage the reading of C.S. Lewis. Um, and, and so, um, yeah, this this to me lends itself to more of a sort of anecdotal approach to talking about his works, um, things having to do with um you know, times that I encountered, um, Lewis and, and what that meant to me. And one of the things that really, um, one of the, um, points at which I really, um, began to absorb C.S. Lewis, right. Not just be aware of C.S. Lewis stuff, um, but really absorb it were long car trips. Um, when my parents would put on the John Cleese, um uh readings of c.s lewis and so to this day or not not readings of c.s lewis, john cleese readings of the screw tape letters um, and so to this day i can't read the screw tape letters without hearing the voice of basil faulty um in my mind um it's uh the, the two the two are practically inextricable to me so this is the <laughs> primary way that i encounter this and and as a result um i still have um, you know, sizable portions of the screw tape mem letters like memorized, right? And 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 this also, um, this also was a um, was just a great primer in some of the basic thoughts of of C.S. Lewis, some of his um, some of his kind of basic ideas about about love, about God being a hedonist, about um, you know how the devil usually won't try to logic you out of a position, right. But rather, um, you know, uses other means, but they're so, um, you know, they're so succ succinctly put, they're so witty. Um, and, 
um and 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 so substantial at the same time um that uh to me i'd say this is probably at least to my young mind um was uh the most important um lewis book um you know from from i'd say probably around the time i was 12 or 13 or 14 okay um, yeah i was just getting ready to listen to it uh yeah. how old you were when you first uh yeah heard it so that's yeah, my best see. guess but yeah. it all it all runs together um yeah i i the the way that um you know the way the way that Cleese interpreted it as well um is is um j- he was able to you know get clearly very angry when screw tape is angry you know and 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 wry when screw tape is is uh is wry um and uh yeah it's it's just uh yeah it's it's the best interpretation of the screw tape letters for my money um and um yeah but obviously all of that comes from the text itself and all of that Cleese finds there in the uh in 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 lewis's you know, excellencies as a, as a prose stylist and satirist. Well, now, um, one of the things when I did encounter his, his, uh, reading of it, which was after I, I had read it, uh, quite a few times. In fact, even though this is not video, I'm showing to Chris right now, a copy. This is actually the, the, the same, uh, uh, book. While this is not the same book, this is the same cover uh, I want to say it was 1982 based on when I first started reading Lewis, I was putting dates in the beginning of the book and several other books have dates around 82. And so this is my third copy of the screw tape letters that I bought in 1985. And so it's a, a copy with a, a flame on it. Uh, do you recall which book version you first, uh, uh bought or maybe read, uh, offhand, uh, Chris? Yeah. So it was a, it was a, very different um uh version i believe it was it was uh this old um uh simon and Schuster, mm-hmm. um uh version it's part of a uh um you know a part of a set um of, it's got like prints of leaves on it and it was part of a set with like the great divorce and problem of pain and mere christianity and and all of those so this is the earliest i remember oh okay i'm I may have had an earlier um, version. I the the flame cover does not look. Not I don't familiar. think I ever had. What? Well, yeah, this one we won't digress in terms of to. Um, I hate to use the word controversy. To me, it's not. Um, I had a chance to talk with Walter Hooper uh, before he passed away. I, I interviewed him uh, at his home in Oxford. But this is the oh, one that cool. has a study guide that is uh, written by Hooper and Owen Barfield. And so it's it's a very small one. In fact, it planted the seed for what later became my own study guide to the Screwtape Letters, mm-hmm. the, the book entitled C.S. Lewis uh, Goes to Hell. But this is what was published uh, to where there, there's no, and, and, and I do uh, agree with people who say, well, there's no acknowledgement that there is some there is some editing done to the actual text of Lewis. And so it's not noted, but this one has some changes mm. uh, in it. And uh, uh, to be honest, I still enjoyed it. Uh, the, the main things that stood out to me and uh, th- this copy, although my, my third one, I, I see several different um, uh, highlights, you know, in, in the first letter where he, st- he starts out uh, in, in, the, in the first paragraph, uh, one of the things says jargon, not argument is your best ally in keeping him from the church. And so I've got that underlined and then several other things in, in this letter. And so um, it's you know very, very fascinating. Uh, in fact, with that, um, or, or, or this copy, it was um, several years later that I discovered there was an audio version to where Hooper himself, Walter Hooper, he actually did the imp- an impersonation of screw tape. And so hmm. that was my first audio encounter with the screw tape letters. Oh, and so cool. that's what I tend to hear initially, although I, I've listened to uh, Cleese's version and to where that one also I can you know, muster up when I'm reading. I, I, I can hear some of his uh, way he inflected. But it's also interesting that Hooper decided to not do too much of the inflections at different points, like when he's losing his cool, he was a little bit more held back. Uh, but then 
he's not an actor, but then everyone can have their own interpretation. I know I, right. even though I knew some different things about the, the screw tape letters in terms of the kind of the background information of Lewis's approach to where it was more of a bureaucratic and he's wanting to get away from the devil in the red types, a uh, tight. Uh, and so, um, one of the things though, when I did my, my book, I did my own screw tape letter and I did an audio rendition of it. And yet, uh, I don't know that I think Lewis would probably say, no, you don't want to do this, but I tried to do a demonic sounding voice, which a lot of times people might do, but then Lewis was saying, no, it's more of a, 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 a bureaucracy, more of a business like atmosphere to where it's not necessarily a fiendish stereotypical, just like in America today. The average American, if you talk about angels, they think of some soft, little, cuddly type, um, uh, you know, angel that uh, you would, you know, want to hug, you know, a mm -hmm. baby or something to where in the Bible, that's not the way angels are portrayed. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's, um, you know, it's, it's rightly one of Lewis's most famous books. In fact, if it wasn't for, it wasn't for Narnia, I imagine it would probably be his best known. Um, right. In fact, uh, th yeah, this was his first claim to to fame. In fact, right. he got on the cover of Time magazine because mm -hmm. of the screw tape letters. And yep. I always mention to people when uh, you know get into a short conversation. Obviously, I could bore him, bore people to death if they're not too interested. But yeah, it, you know, can you imagine being so famous? that you're on the cover of Time magazine. Now, of course, some people today, younger audience, wouldn't necessarily uh, consider, you know, be as much aware of Time, but how much of an honor mm -hmm. that was. But to be then more well-known for something else, but yet being on the cover of a, you know, big news magazine. And so uh, that that was the case with Lewis, with the with the screw tape letters. That really um, sent him a, a, as a um, household name in um, in, you know, America. He was already well known uh, in, in in the UK and such, but I'm I'm curious. Were there any particular quotes from the Screw Tape letters? You mentioned some themes. Are there either quotes or themes that stood out to you, even if you don't remember the exact uh, letter? Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it's 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 another version to me of the what's your favorite C.S. Lewis book um, because I can't really choose you know just one um and so uh this this so colored my thinking um you know from from a very young age that it is it is very hard to pick out just you know just just one but i love i love the one where um uh screw tape is um is chastising wormwood for allowing uh the patient to fall in love um, and the kind of the very worst kind of love and with a patient who does not even or and with a, you know, a, a girl who does not even appear in the uh, in the report uh, that, uh, that 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 would uh, sent him. Um, so um, uh, just, you know, him him kind of going on about how much he hates love. Right. Um, and, and even who hates how much he hates uh, earthly love. Right. Um, so we've got. Um, um, I have looked up this girl's dossier and I'm horrified at what I find. Not only a Christian, but such a Christian, a vile, sneaking, simpering, demure, monosyllabic, mouse-like, watery, insignificant, virginal, bread and butter, miss, the little brute she makes me vomit. She stinks and scalds through the very pages of the dossier. It drives me mad the way the world is worse. And we'd had we'd have had her in the arena in the old days. Not that's the sort that's what her sort is made for. Not that she do much good there either. A two-faced little cheat, I know the sort, who looks as if she'd faint at the sight of blood and then dies with a smile. A cheat every way. Looks as if butter wouldn't melt in her mouth, melt in her mouth, and yet has a satirical wit. The sort of creature who'd find me funny. Filthy and sipping little prude, and yet ready to fall into this booby's arms like any other breeding animal. Why doesn't the enemy blast her for it? If he's so moonstruck by virginity, instead of looking on there, grinning. He's a hedonist at heart. All those facts and vigils and stakes and crosses are only facade. Or only like foam on the seashore. Out at sea, out in his sea, there is pleasure and more pleasure. He makes no secret of it. At his right hand are pleasures forevermore. Oh, I don't think he has the least inkling of that high and austere mystery to which we rise in miserific vision. He's vulgar, Wormwood. He's a bourgeois mind. Um, so yeah, that's... 
And I can tell fantastic. you're doing the um, the uh, Cleese uh, version because doing I doing a very bad yeah <laughs> Cleese impression. Yes, but it's the only way I can I can interpret this. Um, but uh, but yeah, um, it's uh, um, and then of course you know by the end of that letter he gets so worked up that he that uh. Right, yeah. Here yeah, the yeah. manuscript breaks off and is resumed in a different hand. In the heat of composition, I find that I have inadvertently allowed myself to assume the form of a large centipede. I am accordingly dictating the rest to my secretary. Now that the transformation is complete, I recognize it as a periodical phenomenon. Some rumor of it has reached the humans, and a distorted account of it appears in the poet Milton, with a ridiculous addition that such changes of shape are a punishment imposed on us by the enemy. A more modern writer, someone with a name like Pshaw, has however gar- grasped the truth transformation proceeds from within and is a glorious manifestation of that life force which our father would worship if he worshipped anything but himself in my present form i feel even more anxious to see you to unite you to myself in an indissoluble embrace signed toad pipe for his abysmal sublimity under secretary screw tape t-e-b-s etc um so the, you know, it's it's one of those it's one of Lewis's many works that showcases, um, you know, all at the same time, his ability to, um, his his you know facility with dialectic and and logic and clarity, um, right? But but combined with amazing imagination and sense of humor, um, and it's it's you know it's it's very com not very common it's 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 wonderful to find a writer who can write about difficult theological topics with lucidity the way lewis does um it's really really difficult to find someone who can do it as creatively as lewis does and with the same degree of a sense of humor um that's that's honestly um yeah what what makes uh lewis as as someone who writes explicitly about the faith um an unparalleled writer um Mm -hmm. and someone someone who just hasn't been uh matched uh since in in my opinion anyway oh yeah definitely yeah yeah well and, and since you're reading the 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 letter that has toad pipe i'm curious have you seen the screw tape play with max mclean where uh, toad pipe is the other uh, character to uh, bounce off of yeah i have i have um yeah i saw it in uh uh off broadway in uh, in new york once um but, yeah. yeah it was it was some time ago but uh but yeah it was, it was a lot of fun yeah you're very good so yeah so um those uh, listening here uh, hopefully if you haven't read the screw tape letters We've given you enough of a taste to want to, or if you have, that you'll want to reread it. I know I'm I'm overdue for for reading it, uh, you know, with the with the risk of sounding like a commercial since I did that study guide so many years ago. Uh, I haven't really returned to it as much as maybe if I hadn't and and, and such, but uh, I I need to uh, do that. But uh, we're going to go ahead and 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 move on though because. Uh, I'm going to talk about a, a, a few more books here, and that is, uh, I believe, The Horse and His Boy. Um, maybe there could have been any Narnia ones, but you'll uh, share with us, uh, Chris, as to why The Horse and, the, and His Boy from all of the seven books of Narnia that you uh, picked that one. Is there something special about it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's, it's, it's not necessarily even my favorite Narnia book. Uh, I think that honor belongs either to... Uh... Um, the silver chair or to the voyage of the lawn treader um but again like kind of telling the story of you know what c.s lewis books i enjoy biographically anyway uh, the horse and his boy has a special place in my heart because my uh, my mother who was a, a fifth grade teacher um and then later a fourth grade teacher would read it every year um, to to her class and so um so i actually was um it was a small enough school that i was in my mother's class um and so i remember her you know reading it to us um so it's it's got a special place in my heart because of uh, because of that um but uh yeah it's a it's i mean it's a great book it's you know um uh saying it's it's not my favorite book 
my, not my favorite Narnia book doesn't uh, doesn't mean it's not well worth reading. It's it's fantastic and, and a lot of fun. Um, uh, Narnia generally, of course, worth reading. Um, uh, I actually didn't come to um, appreciate and enjoy Narnia um, as deeply as a child as I did later as an adult. Um, I, uh, I actually got a, a good deal more out of it, um, you know, actually after the screw tape period, um, uh, when I would sort of return to Narnia and, and read it in, uh, say high school and college and, and whatever else. Um, but, uh, mm-hmm. but yeah, it, it's, uh, it, and it, and it has something to do, I think with, with some of the things, um, um, that, we'll talk about later, especially the relationship uh, between humans and animals, um, or, or at least it, uh, at least it complicates it. Um, but yeah, you know, for, for me, the horse and the boy does have good m- memories. Uh, I didn't read any Narnia. Uh, the, the first story was, uh, actually in, in high school when I, uh, had the opportunity or was, was given an assignment. Uh, here's a list of books and, um, uh, I was in, I actually had started out with a regular traditional college prep English class, but that yeah, I was weak in that area. And so I ended up switching because I was, I was doing so bad. I switched classes. Uh, and so, uh, not that this has a negative, uh, reflection on Lewis, uh, because the high school had it as, as, as a possibility. Anyway, so I, I read it, uh, the, the first Narnia, I was aware there were other stories, obviously that the book cover r- reflected that, but it wasn't until, in college that I read the, the rest of them. And then I read them one right after the other, essentially. So over the period, I want to say of a few months. And so while, you know, each of them stand out in my mind in certain ways or certain aspects, the horse and his boy was an engaging story. Well, all of them were, were engaging, but in terms of just, uh, what stood out to me about the horse and his boy was how different it was. Now that also then revisited even more so with the last battle to where, um, you know, I already noted or inferred here, and maybe I'll say it's more later about, um, you know, not being a very strong reader. So, uh, to me, I was, uh, especially, you know, engaged by the, the different stories and it wasn't, you know, distracting or disappointing. Oh, it's not the same set of kids through all the, the, the stories and, and such, but, um, uh, but anyway, but yeah, those are just some off the cuff thoughts about the horse and his boy, but. Uh, even though this is not necessarily your favorite, but in terms of a, a standout memory, uh, other aspects uh, about the book that's, that stand out, either a particular character that you either relate to or there was somebody that was, you know, uh, like them that was maybe not a, um, that was more of a antagonistic character uh, from the book? Well, one of the things I really like about it is, um, as in, I feel like Lewis's best Narnia books don't really happen in Narnia. Um, they they almost always happen in, in in my opinion anyway in a in a different uh, different place. And finally, in the horses' as boy, we get to explore Kellerman. Um, so I'd say, in you know, to the extent that another that a that a land or a country can be a kind of character, um, I suppose uh, you know that's um, that's one of the things I I, I love. Um, most um, uh, about the horse and his boy because you, you get you get a um, um, you get an idea of what the world around Narnia is like you get an idea of Kellerman you get an idea of what Archenland is like um, and uh, yeah they're um, they're they're both enchanting in their own you know in their in their own ways um, uh, you you get introduced to the false god tash um um yeah um just uh um you know it's it's a um yeah i don't i don't know i mean i suppose brie is fantastic right Mm, Um, right yeah he's he's not that's that's not too terribly surprising uh but he he um his his character arc is is a lot of fun that he as someone who has been raised outside of Narnia, um, feels very self-conscious uh, about well, what would a 
proper Narnian horse do in this situation. I need to act like a proper Narnian horse. And, and part of, um, part of what, um, liberates him is, um, is, is not trying to act, um, the, the part of a Narnian horse, uh, but simply, um, you know, do what's right without regard for propriety or, or whatever else. Um, so, um, so yeah, I, I mean, um, I think, uh, um, yeah, I, I think, I think mainly though, the, the lands, honestly, with all of the Narnia books, the lands to me are more engaging than the characters and the, and the, um, enjoy enjoyment of exploration um you know um, mm -hmm. um although although you know obviously lewis uses aslan to highlight amazing and beautiful things about god so in that sense you know he's a very real character who um who who shines through a great deal more than the others right although yeah in in this story the the way lewis presents uh, him is, uh, is, is, is very different. Uh, and um, I had the opportunity, I'm sure maybe you, you've heard of, or maybe you hadn't, but The Horse and the Boy, there's a, a play version that uh, was done at the Museum of the Bible. And, um, oh, cool. And, and it's been, uh, it, well, it's originally from the, um, uh, from the Lagos Theater out of um, South Carolina. But uh, it was uh, so well respected that uh, they got asked to uh, do a performance uh, there, and uh, I had a chance to to see it, and they did a great job portraying. You know the, um, you know you can imagine the challenge that it would be to put it into a play. Yeah. But they they did an excellent job, and I, I deliberately chose not to read the story again before seeing the play, and I had planned to go back afterwards, but I remembered enough of it that uh, it definitely, you know, it's like, wow, they, you know, they really did hit all the key beats of the story uh, with it. And so um, did a great job. But, uh, but yeah, they, uh, you know, in terms of representing Narnia, it, it is hard. It's kind of like, uh, you know, the old adage for, for parents, you know, picking a, a favorite child, you don't have a favorite, but you have fond memories in certain aspects that will stand out at one time or another, or maybe yeah. just, you know, overall. And so, for uh, for you, you know Narnia, uh, the horse and his boy re represents some of the fondest memories because of the association with your mom, and so that makes it really special. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, um, all right, so um, uh, I um, I was originally going to talk about the anthropological approach. I've read the anthropological approach, but I don't remember much about the anthropological <laughs> approach other than, um, you know, other than he talks about Sir Gowan and the Green Knight, specifically the Green Knight, and it's fantastic. Um, and I wanted to highlight some of Lewis's scholarship, but um, so instead I, I, I chose to um, talk about the problem of pain. Um, okay, yeah, which, let's go uh, ahead and yeah move uh, to that uh, for those who aren't. Catch you what Chris is noting in terms of, you know, we could choose either a book or, or an essay that that especially stood out in our minds for various different reasons. It didn't have to necessarily be a favorite, and and, and I found with a book that I boiled down to picking and and somewhat avoiding maybe some that people would maybe be as familiar with, um, and and then so I, I somewhat avoided that, that that I picked a book that it's like, well, hmm, I may not have too much to say, so I, I switched one too that people can find out what that was uh, when they listen to, to your show. But uh, yeah, so for the problem of pain, um, I, I see here in your notes that uh, you hold a controversial view maybe. Uh, you know, we're not gonna get really truly controversial per se, but mm -hmm. um, it, it seems to say here that you think this is superior to mere Christianity. So yeah, that, I do. So that, that should just end our discussion. Forget the show. <laughs> nice, nice knowing you. Never want to talk to you again. Uh, no, uh, just. <laughs> yeah. No, but uh, yeah. Well, yeah. Sh share your thoughts. Uh, you know, that's perfectly fine. Uh, you know, there are some some aspects that I do like it, but then there's other things about mere Christianity that I think are better. Right. But I guess if you did a, a list of you know ten great things or, or why uh, problem of pain for me probably would kind of hold up for, for, for some reasons which maybe you uh, also have so 
since this was the one that you picked, uh, share uh, share your thoughts about it overall or a reason you uh, pick this or why it's better than mere Christianity. Pick any of those. Pick all of those. Hey, yeah, you're, yeah. you're my guest this time. You can uh, do however. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, um, you know, I, it's it's his first work of apologetics um, that he wrote, if you don't count the Pilgrim's Regress, which I don't know that you should. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, um, he, to me, this is a more interesting and uh more a more interesting defense of christianity and one that um one that works better on my type of personality um uh i think mere christianity is is more systematic um and it's um uh, and it's it's brilliant um it, you know, it's based on his radio talks that he gave, um, and, and so it's for a, a general audience. It, it begins with uh, the moral question, um, and 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 basically defending the idea of, of a god through um, right and wrong as a clue to the meaning of the universe. Um, uh, Problem of pain, I like uh, because he begins simply by hitting you. Um, as, Mm -hmm. as forcefully, I think as he can, uh, with basically his reasoning from when he was an atheist for why God couldn't exist. Um, and it's, it's basically, you know, I, I, I pasted a whole chunk here and I'm not going to read it. Um, (laughs) but uh, I'll summarize it. Um, essentially the, the universe is huge, right? Uh, not, not many years ago when I was an atheist, if anyone had asked me, why do you not believe in God? My reply would have run something like this. Look at the universe we live in. By far the greatest part of it consists of empty space, completely dark and unimaginably cold. The bodies which move in this space are so few and so small in comparison with the space itself that even if every one of them were known to be crowded as full of, as it could hold with perfectly happy creatures, it would still be difficult to believe that life and happiness were more than a byproduct to the power that made the universe. As it is, however, the scientists think it likely that very few of the suns of space, perhaps none of them except our own, have any planets. And in our own solar system, in our own system, it is improbable that any planet except the Earth sustains life. And Earth herself existed without life for millions of years and may exist for millions more when life has left her. And what is it like while it lasts? It's so arranged that all the forms can live only by preying upon one another. In the lower forms, this process entails only death. But in the higher, there appears a new quality called consciousness, which enables it to be attended with pain. The creatures cause pain by being born and live by inflicting pain. And in pain, they mostly die. In the most complex of all creatures, man, yet another quality appears, which we call reason, whereby he is enabled to foresee his own pain, which henceforth is preceded with acute mental suffering and to foresee his own death while keenly desiring permanence. Um, mm. So he, he makes the... Um, yeah, you know, he the, does a great job you know, um, summarizing a yeah. uh, typical person uh, who uh, doesn't believe because Lewis was there where he, he didn't. Yep, yep. Yeah. Yeah, the, the yeah near the end uh, of, of that, uh, I um, highlighted when I was re- reviewing, since we had a chance to see each other's choices, mm-hmm. uh, one of the things uh, he, he says near the end is, if you ask me to believe that this is the work of a benevolent and omni- uh, or omnipotent spirit, I reply that all the evidence points in the opposite direction. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, yeah. but then the next paragraph, uh, I think you were going to sh- maybe share that as well. Right. There was something he didn't consider. Yeah. So he proceeds from that to, okay, but um, if you're going to be a pessimist about this and look at all of this, you know, stuff I've just mentioned um, and, and say, well, it's unlikely that I, <laughs> Either there's no spirit or it's a very bad spirit who's made the universe or, or a spirit who just doesn't care. Um, but why in the world would we have ever attributed the universe to, um, to, a, to a wise and good creator? Um, if theology is not something that we are getting from an outside source. Um, and if um, um, there really is nothing to all of this talk of a, of a good God. Um, and if the, an evil universe, a, a, a chaotic and disordered universe 
disproves that there could be a good God, then why in the world would we have ever thought that there was a good God behind it all? Um, and it's, um, um, you know, and he, and he says, basically, you know, we, we had to have gotten that idea from a different source. It can't just be, um, th there's no reason for us to have evolved to have that view. Um, th it's, it's not clear how that would have given us any kind of leg up on, on anyone else. Um, uh, he talks about fear, you know, people saying, well, you know, people are afraid of, um, uh, you know, awe or religious awe or, or a sense of God, right, is, is a, a type of fear, but he makes this distinction between, okay, you've got the kind of fear that you'd feel if someone said there's a tiger in the next room. And then the kind of fear that you'd feel if someone said there's a ghost in the next room. And then the kind of fear that you'd feel if someone said there was a mighty spirit in the next room, all three are different kinds of fear. Um, and, uh, and, and it talks about this sort of sense of the numinous. Um, and to me, um, you know, that's just really interesting bringing in the numinous, mm -hmm. bringing in Rudolf Otto, right. Um, uh, talking about how, um, uh, you know, the, the Hebrew Bible is where we first get this association of the numinous divine, which is beyond humanity and powerful in a way that we fear, although we don't quite know exactly what it could do to us, right? It makes us feel our mortality very deeply, um, connecting that with, um, with, the idea of this kind of absolute morality, right? And he, he kind of makes the point that until the Hebrews, our sense, you know, our, our sort of sense of morality and duty and our sense of cowering before the gods came from two different places uh, or, or seemed to, right? And then and you have them identified with each other in, in, uh, in, in the Hebrew scriptures. Um, and uh, yeah, and... Uh, you know some some of his philosophical arguments like um taking down the idea that if god were good and also omnipotent um this wouldn't be happening that wouldn't be happening and he sort of talks about well you know um the way the way that things are made the way that things are um the, honestly the way that things are um the, there's a difference between God being omnipotent and God being able to do things that are inherently impossible, right? That are contradictions in terms. Um, God can't make something that is both, um, you know, orange and blue at the same time because these are opposite colors, right? Um, uh, this would, this would be an inherently absurd thing. So a lot of times we expect God to do the inherently absurd and override our will while at the same time insisting on having free will. Um, and, and, you, you can't have both of those things. Mm, yeah, um, yeah, that reminds me, someone uh, in the last 20 years r wrote a song, uh, Smell the Color Nine. It's like, yeah, you can't smell the color nine. So, you, you, right. you know, so that's a very, very, yeah, good point yeah. there. And then, yeah, I, and I think you are going to make a comment. I mean, there's very many good chapters, obviously. It's yeah. not a very long book. But I, I, I do like, uh, well, one, one of the benefits of, of mere Christianity is he did have someone else, even though he, Lewis was an excellent writer, he was constrained by the times because of being on the radio. Although he did add, uh, he did ha put additional material, he, stuck, he, he kept to those constraints essentially. But, uh, but anyway, here he was able to kind of just not worry about, okay, I got to do it in like a 15 minute uh, read here and so the chapters right. aren't too much longer but i think you were going to especially note uh um, at the end yeah yeah near near the end he um after after dealing with uh human pain after dealing with the doctrine of hell um i think two of the best chapters in the book are animal pain and on heaven um and he um I remember reading this in, in high school um, and just being kind of blown away by, um, you mean it's not heretical to say that maybe animals could be saved? Um, which, like, I'm not the 
biggest animal lover, frankly. Um, I, I don't, I don't have pets myself. My children are my pets. Um, <laughs> because I, and, and I don't have much more bandwidth for that, that than that, but I love his, I love Lewis's sympathy and I admire his sympathy for animals. Um, and I, I, um, I, I think his point is a really excellent point. It's really imaginative. Um, and it's not, you know, growing up, I, I, people would make this kind of glib, somewhat imagineless point that because animals don't have souls, therefore, you know, when Fluffy dies, sorry, kid, you're never seeing him, never seeing her again. Um, and you know, almost with a kind of like, mm -hmm. yeah. with a kind of, Callousness. uh, yeah, a kind of callous joy, right? Um, sometimes, um, like, oh, sorry, hippie. Uh, right um and uh I, I just like that lewis is is a is a deeper thinker than that and and he he leaves open the possibility that he's wrong right uh, but he's like okay look um animals very often if if we believe that humans are given dominion over animals and that means it, and animal uh, animals are named by humans given a kind of identity by humans um and humans, in turn, are given their identity by, by God. Could it not be that our salvation in Christ extends out to the animal kingdom, um, and that the animals that are um, tamed in some way, associated in some way with redeemed humanity, would also be redeemed in their own way, in proportion to their own, you know, level of consciousness or, or whatever else? Um, and I, I just love his opening the door for that, um, mm -hmm. and and and, you know clarifying what needs to be believed by serious Christians and what maybe is not spelled out um, terribly clearly in the Bible um, right um, uh, that that yeah we we have as much reason to say that animals are saved as they aren't saved um, so we don't need to, um, you know, we, we don't need to be dogmatic about things about which we don't really have dogma. Um, so, uh, so yeah, I, 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 I love that. I love his chapter on heaven as well, um, that he, um, that, that he makes the point that, you know, we haven't desired anything else besides heaven. Um, to to the very common point that like well what are we gonna do like sing in church all day right um, <laughs> and right. Uh, and you know he he's he says uh, something like I used to I used to wonder if anybody actually desired heaven and now I wonder if we've ever really desired anything else because all of our interests are fragments of our desires. Uh, for heaven, which which is you know our desire for God, so the so the twists and turns in our own personality are like um, the twists and turns of a, of a key, right? That we're meant to open a particular lock, um, and uh, um, and we're created exactly as we are with our precise interests and turns in our personality um, to fit um, uh, this you know, this, this absolute reality, um, of, of, in, of which God is the center, right. And, and, um, and which God sustains. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful, um, um, uh, piece of writing about heaven, um, that, that identifies it with Sansuk, um, and also with the reference, um or of of any like really disinterested interest right uh, any any like um love of something right um is ultimately a love of heaven um expressed in a local and limited way right now um that that one day and to the extent that it is laid down um uh will be encountered again in fuller form um right and um in uh the life to come uh, mm. but uh yeah it's yeah some themes that he touched on uh with when i'll be on your show the uh, weight of glory 
uh, touches on uh, some of those yes. aspects. So, yep. very, yep. very good. Well, then uh, finally, Chris, uh, before we uh, stop and then I'll be on your show, we encourage people to listen to that as well as the other programs that are out there for the C.S. Lewis Reading Day. Uh, we want to have you share uh, a final book that you had selected, uh, mainly from his scholarly works, although you reference some other things as well here. But the discarded image is something that um, most people, unless they're really into Lewis, haven't heard. So give us a thumbnail sketch about it and then what uh, makes it stand out in your mind especially. Yeah, so the um, discarded image is it's based on a series of lectures he would give um, at at Oxford about basically the the medieval world um, and the um, and the way that medieval people viewed the universe, um, what was around them, um, especially in relation to knowledge that they inherited from the past, right? So, um, so from Latin authors especially, um, but. Um, but yeah, it's called the discarded image because it's a um, it's a view of the universe um, as the medieval saw it, um, and and in you know it is it is not obviously as well known as shape letters um, or or Narnia um, among medievalists and especially teachers of medieval literature is very well known um, because um, what what Lewis does is he um, uh, recovers a way of viewing the world um, that has um, that's been discarded partly because of science, you know, um, partly because of you know learning that the um, that the Earth travels around the Sun rather than vice versa. Uh, but he w what he does is he he shows this sort of medieval model, this way of viewing the Earth. Um, as one of really the great achievements, even if ultimately like according to, you know, in, in, um, in the view of science, right. Uh, there, there are some things that are, um, incorrect. Um, it's, um, it's ability to inspire, um, it's brilliant, um, uh, structure, um, is, um, uh, is is something that you know Milton was really even still working under uh, as as he was writing, um, and um, yeah, basically uh, it's it's the world as the still dead tiny center of the cosmos, um, and then above us, uh, as you look up and you should view the cosmos as um, as being not just far the stars is not just far but very very high um if you go out and look up at the night sky um you see the fixed star the fixed stars um, who don't change in relation to each other um but then below them in a series of concentric spheres you see these different planetary intelligences and they're called um, planets because they're wandering stars because planeo means to wander um and um, and each of these wandering stars has a different virtue uh, until finally you come um, beyond all of them, past the fixed stars, and out into the Empyrean, uh, which is the heaven of heavens, which you can't, um, uh, which which is beyond your senses, essentially beyond space and time as well. Um, and, and and it's at that point that uh, the universe sort of. Um, uh, goes inside out um, and suddenly all things are gathered around um, God. So it's very Dantean. Um, he's, he's basically recovering the, the model of the universe that Dante uh, describes. Um, but, um, you know, and, and, and adding things like there's a chapter about, you know, fairies essentially um, and where they fit in with, in the medieval's, model of all things but one of the things that he says again and again and again are the medievals were a bookish people they weren't illiterate they were highly highly literate and uh, tended in fact to be so bookish that they didn't want to get rid of any books um, so they would try to harmonize all of their ancient sources and this is what produced this sort of model and and their their you know his motto for them was uh a place for everything and everything in its place, right? Um, that um, that this is uh, that that the 
medievals were um, catalogers, right? Um, they loved figuring out exactly where something would go. Um, and, and the result over centuries was this um, brilliantly multifaceted and yet incredibly organized, like a cathedral, um, uh, view of the universe. Hmm. Yeah, and uh, th this is one of the uh, books by Lewis, uh, and, and not all of his um, scholarly type uh, works um, I find less interesting because that's not my field, but this one I, I, I tried to read. Uh, I have the Kindle version, and I've, uh, I guess I do have a print version. That's neither here nor there. But um, a year or so ago, they did come up with a, or come out with an audio version. So it, it is available on audio. I did pick that up. I got so many different audio things that I'm listening to. <laughs> so oh, I haven't. Me too. But, uh, but I, I will have to try to uh, put that in queue for something that I do listen to because the audio version is just under six uh, hours. So it's not a long book. Um, yeah. There, there is an audio version of his um, uh, big uh, um, uh, title, of the the yes, Oxford the History of, of English Language. Um, yeah. I, I don't have in front of me the the audio one, but I might yeah. be able to bring it up before we uh, leave here. I, uh, I got that audio book actually. I was oh there. I, mm -hmm. I get I get yeah. a free credit okay, from yeah. Audible every month, and I'm like, oh man, that's that's a lot of book for that one credit. So right, it's it's it's, o it's over 25 hours. I just looked it yeah. up. Yeah, so it's 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 quite a bit. Uh... <laughs> so great. Well, well, Chris, it's been really good having you uh, on the show. And so oh, for it's those, been so great being on. Well, thank you for for those uh, who, uh, regardless, here we we hope you will listen to uh, everyone's uh, contribution here to the C.S. Lewis Reading Day, whether it's on the Reading Day or not. So we're going to pause our conversation here, the Inklings Variety Hour. I'll have a link in the show notes for that. Chris will talk with me about some of my either favorite works or things that are standing out, which will include the Weight of Glory essay, the Screwtape Proposes a Toast essay, and we'll leave it as a mystery as to what books I might talk about. So, uh, but we want to encourage the listeners to leave a comment to let us know uh, a work by Lewis that you especially enjoy or maybe one that you just started reading. And then if you're listening to this uh, on the, the November 29th uh, C.S. Lewis Reading Day, whether it be 2023 or another year, you happen to stumble across it exactly on that time, then uh, use uh, hashtag C.S. Lewis Reading Day on social media to let people know about this annual event. So, Chris, uh, thanks for being on the show today. All right. Thank you so much, William. We'll see you. See you next time. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Chris, host of the Inklings Variety Hour podcast. As noted at the top of the show, I will be on his show talking about a few works by Lewis on November 29th, the date of the first annual C.S. Lewis Reading Day. Again, I'm William O'Flaherty. My podcast, All About Jack, has been around since... 2011. My more recent YouTube channel is called Knowing and Understanding C.S. Lewis. Be sure to check out my short feature called The Latest on C.S. Lewis that focuses on timely news. Check the description or show notes for links to items mentioned in the show today. Finally, everything I do related to Lewis is centralized at the website EssentialCSLewis.com and in case you didn't know, I've written two Lewis-themed books. The misquotable C.S. Lewis was released in 2018. It examines 75 quotations credited to him that he either didn't write or paraphrases of something he did or without the context could be misunderstood. Then in 2016, my enhanced study guide to the screw tape letters came out. It's called C.S. Lewis Goes to Hell. Thanks again for listening and please consider liking and sharing this episode with others. <laughs>